All right, well, today we continue our series uh, called The Predestination Puzzle. And if you weren't here last week, we're going to take just a, a few minutes to uh, review where we've been. Now, remember the idea, the popular idea of predestination is that God goes down the city street and he says, I'll take you, but not you, you, but not you, heaven for you and hell for you and heaven for you and hell for you. Quite literally, God pre-selecting those who can and will believe and leaving others out with no choice. We looked at this popular idea of predestination and we found that there were a few issues with it. Just using common, everyday human logic, there are a few issues that arise. Number one, how would you ever know that you are picked? On Monday, you feel picked. On Tuesday, you feel semi-picked. On Wednesday, you're not feeling so picked. Sunday comes around, the preacher preaches a pretty tough sermon, and now you're certain you're not picked. How would you know you're picked? Issue number two, would there really be a need for evangelism? If everything is rigged and if God has pre-picked certain people for salvation, surely we could just sit on our hands and say grace, 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 grace with no need to share the good news because hearing and believing would not really be necessary if everything were fated. Issue number three, it leaves Christians engaging in a Plato-Socrates-style debate over fate versus free will. And certainly we have seen this in the church today, haven't we? The church being divided down the middle over this issue of predestination. And essentially then we get into heated arguments. Everybody tries to go away friendly, but they're gritting their teeth as they discuss the issue of fate versus free will in the body of Christ. So last week we looked at the book of Ephesians and if you remember that message or if you want to go back and look at it online you can but in short we found that the key to understanding predestination in Ephesians was to see the difference between Jews and Gentiles. You may recall that I color-coded things in the book of Ephesians, red signifying Jews and yellow signifying Gentiles, and this was the result. Ephesians 1.4, he chose us Jews. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us Jews. Ephesians 1.12, we Jews who were the first to put our hope in Christ, the Jews heard the message first. And then Ephesians continues and it says, And you also, you Gentiles also were included. As for you, you were dead. But God made the two groups one to reconcile both of them together. So the true meaning of predestination in Ephesians, as we saw, was this predestined plan for God to choose the Gentiles and include them in the gospel invitation so that Jew and Gentile would come together in one new man, the new creation in Jesus Christ. And so Ephesians 2.18 says this, through whom we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father. And then Ephesians 3, the conclusion of it all, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. That is the news flash in the book of Ephesians. Concerning predestination, this was the big news of the day that those dirty Greeks, and by the way, we'll see those dirty Romans, and those dirty Americans, and those dirty Canadians, and those dirty and you fill in the blank every nation of the world. Now the gospel is for the whosoever wills. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself, not just Jews. All right, well, today we're in part two of the predestination puzzle. Now we're looking at Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11. Of course, we're not going to cover all of those verses, but we're going to look at the important points along the way as Paul, again, drives home a very similar idea. So as we do this in Romans, a few questions will come up. 
hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. If individual selection, if God is not individually selecting, then what in the world does the Apostle Paul mean when he says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened? Didn't God harden Pharaoh's heart? What does Jacob I loved and Esau I hated mean? And what is the potter clay analogy really all about? These are questions we need to ask as we look in the book of Romans at this issue of predestination. So today's question, if God did not pre-select those who would believe, then what is Romans saying to us? All right, well, with that, we have a sneak preview, one that I gave you last week as well. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. This is the pinnacle of all that Paul wants to say in these chapters. How do we know that? Because he, he has this question for us. What shall we conclude? What shall we say then? Where am I going with this? What am I trying to accomplish with all this argumentation? Here's Paul's answer. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? So just hold this in your mind because this is Paul's main point in all of this discussion about predestination. This is where he's going. That the dirty, rotten Gentiles, that those who were not chasing God, had no interest in God, didn't even know God's name, and they were killing Israel, their lineage, their heritage was to go to war against God's chosen people. Those dirty Gentiles, which are in this room, by the way, that's us. Our heritage, our lineage, for most of us in this room, if you're not Jewish, guess what you are? You're Gentile. So this message is about us. God's secret plan then was that Gentiles who were not chasing after him, who were not pursuing righteousness, would somehow find it. Not by law, not by bloodline, not by heritage, not by geography, but by faith. And so we begin our look into the book of Romans We'll see several parts today. This first part, part 2a, we're going to see Romans chapter 8. God is talking about his predestined purpose and growth for the church collectively. So what we're about to see is, you know, the Romans are being persecuted. The Romans are suffering. And what we need to understand is that Paul is trying to comfort them. You know, when, when it says God works all things together... That is a comfort passage. The whole point is, no matter what you're going through, there is a predestined plan for you. There is growth on the horizon for you. He who began a good work in you is going to carry you on to completion. Now watch this. Romans 8. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So there is definitely a predestined plan for the church. I mean, my goodness, it's plastered all over the New Testament that God had a secret plan to unleash the gospel, and in that, there is certainly a new purpose, isn't there? If you are in Christ, there is a new purpose for you. If you are in Christ, there is a new calling. We are called to new things. We have spiritual gifts. We have a new way to think. We have a new way to act. We get to exude Jesus Christ. So for the church collectively, for the bride of Jesus Christ, it has always been God's plan that we would have a special mission, purpose, calling, and that we would be different from the world. That's what he's saying. Romans, please, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're suffering, you need to know that you're, you're part of something bigger than yourself. There is a collective plan for the people of God. Verses 29 and 30 drive this home for those whom he foreknew. Did God foreknow? Of course, God foreknows everything. Does God know the future? I believe he does. Otherwise, the book of Revelation would not be written. God knows the future. He created time. He created our sense of time. He lives outside of time. And so he foreknew us. Absolutely. He also predestined to what? Every single child of God that he knew ahead of time 
would believe in him, what did he predestine us to? To growth, to conformity, to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and those whom he predestined, predestined to what? To be conformed to the knowledge of Jesus, to grow and learn and get the renewing of the mind. No matter what we're suffering, we need to know this. And those whom he predestined, he also called. That is, he gave a calling, a holy, righteous calling. We have a new mission. We have a new purpose. We have a new calling, and that is to bear fruit now. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is talking about the entirety of the bride of Jesus Christ. Are we called to be justified? Absolutely. Are we called to one day be glorified? Absolutely. Have, has the church, has the bride of Christ been pre-selected to head in this direction, one day getting a resurrection body and in the meantime growing? Absolutely. So if you don't yet understand what I believe this means, hang on. I want to share a few comments of my own on this. Romans 8. God looked at all of his children down the timeline of human history, and he promised us in advance that he would work all things together for our growth. Do you see that? So it's not about you, but not you. You've got a chance, but you don't have a chance. You have a chance, but forget you. No, what we're going to see is that in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul actually works overtime to say it's whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So what can this mean? Again, Romans 8, Paul is talking about what all believers are corporately predestined for. Can we all agree that one day the church will be glorified? Absolutely. Can we all agree that the church collectively has been justified, made right? Absolutely. Can we all agree that the church collectively, that we have a calling, that in the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people, and today the church, we collectively are chosen? Was it certain Jews that were chosen in the Old Testament, or was it the Jewish nation? Was it certain individuals that were chosen within the nation of Israel? Or was it the entire country? We're seeing the same thing today. This is about the collection of the saints, the entirety of the bride of Christ, and the calling that we have in Him. This was encouraging to the Romans because they were suffering. Verse 18 tells us this. This was encouraging to the Romans because they were experiencing weakness. Verse 26 tells us this. In other words, the comforting message is, Romans, no matter what you're going through, you need to know this has been rigged. This has been planned. God's not going to let you go. He's never going to let you go. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's going to carry you on to completion. No matter what stress is going on in your life right now, no matter how much you're being persecuted, you need to know that if you are one of his, then he is going to take care of you. He planned to take care of all of us. So it is also true that Christians are collectively chosen. Can we not say the church is God's chosen people? We, the church, are God's chosen people, just as we see all of Israel as God's chosen people in the Old Testament. If Paul had wanted to communicate individual selection in this passage, he certainly could have done so very clearly. The straightforward reading here is that the heavenly calling or purpose and the predestined conformity to his son, that is growth of these Romans, was communicated as encouragement to them in the midst of their trouble and in the midst of their hardship. All right, well now we see part 2B. It gets interesting as the Gentiles are predestined to be included in the gospel invitation. Again, we're going to see something similar to last week. Don't worry, I've kept the colors the same. Okay, red is for Jews and yellow is for Gentiles. Here we go. All right, Romans chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Yes. 
That's what I've been trying to say. It's just so succinct, you know? There's a gift there and a calling. For I wish, I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. All right, so before we ever get into Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, before we get to Pharaoh, I hardened his heart, before we get to potter and clay and that analogy, he has already started talking about his countrymen who are Jews, and then he's saying, I wish I could sort of stir them to jealousy by what's happening with the Gentiles. It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. In other words, hello, fellow Jews, please know that your flesh, your body, your bloodline, your heritage, your lineage, your country doesn't matter in terms of salvation. It is irrelevant now. There is a new message in town. It's called the New Covenant. And here it is, that it's the children of the promise. What was the promise? Hey, Abraham, you will be the father of many nations, not just Israel. And so the children of this promise are all over the world so that whosoever believes will become a descendant by faith not by Judaism, not by law, not by bloodline, not by Israel, not by heritage, but by faith. And so the floodgates are opened wide, and whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 9 continues talking about Jacob and Esau, these twins. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, admittedly, here we see a, a picture, a shadow, a symbol of Jews and Gentiles, Jacob represents the Jewish people. Esau represents the opposite. And so there was a division there, a chasm there. But what you see through this passage is God can do whatever he wants. That's his point. Paul is defending God's right to choose whatever he wants. So what did God choose that was so controversial? What did God do that was so controversial that Paul has to defend it? For multiple chapters in Romans, what God did was he included the dirty Gentiles in salvation. And people were so ticked off and so offended and it was so unbelievable to them that Paul has to go back through human history. He has to go back through the Old Testament and he has to show us, look, God has historically done whatever he wants. Do you remember Jacob I loved, Esau I hated? It could have been Esau I loved, Jacob I hated. I could have hated them both. I could have loved them both. But it was my call and that's the point. I call the shots. He would say, I am God and you are not. And so with that in mind then, what he is trying to say is if God is calling the shots, then let God do whatever he wants. He's going to do it anyway. So quit objecting to this whole idea that the Gentiles now have a gospel invitation. This thought continues, what shall we say then? This will help. Paul's going to say, what's my point again? What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend upon the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Now you'll notice I put in yellow the word whom. That's because this is the controversial people that are being shown compassion. I mean, the Gentiles are the ones that bring up the controversy. Why is Paul defending this? 
God can have mercy on whomever he wants to have mercy. God can have compassion on whomever he wants to have compassion. It's because he's about to reveal that God has chosen to have mercy and compassion on the Greek people. Greek people, are you serious? Yes, Greek people. Hey, Peter, stop being a racist. Greek people, too. Peter wouldn't even eat with them. And so Paul had to confront him and chew him out and show him the truth so that he would see. He would see that when the Son of Man is lifted up, God will draw all unto himself. The invitation is for anyone and everyone. And so you see the whom here highlighted in yellow because that's the controversy. Would it be any question at all that God would want to have mercy on Jewish people? Of course. Would God want to have compassion on the Jews? Of course. And He did for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. But the news flash is that God would extend this mercy and compassion to the Gentiles so that now it doesn't depend on the Jewish man who is using willpower How? Because of Moses. It doesn't depend on the Jewish man who is using willpower and obedience to the law and running, running, running. It doesn't depend on that at all. It is about God who has chosen to have mercy on whomever he wants. So you can imagine, here's the Jewish person and they're running on a treadmill for thousands of years. They're running on this treadmill of the law. They've got faith. Faith is an option, but they have misunderstood the law. They think that the law is the way to life. They think that the law is the way to salvation. They think that the law, the treadmill of the law, is the way to righteousness. So they are exerting willpower, and they are exerting this this strength, this supposed strength in trying to obey in order to be made right and stay right with God. And then over here next to him, right next to the Jewish person, in this corner, hailing from every other country in the world, we have the Gentile. And the Gentile looks over at the Jew who is running, you know, on this treadmill, and he says, what do you think you're doing? And, and the Jewish person replies, Moses. And the Gentile person replies, Moses who? I've never heard of him. And, and the Jewish person replies, well, Yahweh. And the Gentile person replies, Yahweh who? I've never heard of him. And the point is, is that God has now extended mercy and compassion to the person who was not running and not exerting willpower and didn't have the law and wasn't seeking righteousness and wasn't chasing after God and didn't even know his name. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed where? Throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens who he desires. Who did he harden? Pharaoh. Who is he having mercy on? Gentiles. You see, God gets to do whatever he wants. He is God and we are not. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? In other words, who are you to challenge God when he hardened Pharaoh's heart? Who are you to get in God's face and say, you can't do what you want. God can do what he wants. And there's no answer back that we have for him. And then we look around the earth and we say, wait a minute, there's Jews and Gentiles. God, are you telling me that you're going to do whatever you want with these two people groups? Why did you even even allow there to be Jews and Gentiles? Why were the Jews honored for so long? Why were they created for honorable use? And then you had these Gentile tribes and peoples that were warred against for, for thousands of years. Atheists will bring this up, right? This is their big contention that the Old Testament is so violent and so hard to understand. And how can I believe in a God who 
And you fill in the blank there with your favorite Old Testament story about conflict and war and violence. Well, the point is God chose Israel. He's protecting Israel so that Jesus can come through the line of Judah, through Israel. And in the meantime, Gentiles who come against the plan of God, well, they didn't fare so well. And so there were some who were for honorable use and some who were for common use. Now, those who would try to make this into individual selection, I would challenge you to somehow get the idea of hell out of common use. Hell is not a common use. It would be, you know, uh, vessels of destruction, not common use. And so we're going to see that there were vessels prepared for wrath, but God did something with them. He saved them out of that. And those are the Gentiles. Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, here it comes. So imagine if, we're not going to push you on this, but just hypothetically, you know, what if God Although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. They were on their way to hell. They were prepared for destruction, but God did something. He rescued. They were vessels of wrath. We were vessels of wrath. Our heritage, our forefathers, dancing around pagan campfires, trying to get right and get clean and stay good with their deity, their pagan deity. This is our lineage and heritage. We were vessels of wrath and we were prepared for destruction. We didn't even know God's name. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us collectively, the church, whom he also called not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Do you see it? The two people groups. There was a plan to have a church. There was a plan to have the bride of Christ. But it wasn't going to be Jewish. It was going to be Jews and Gentiles brought together. Now hang on, if you're still not sure about this, watch as he enforces the importance of the message going out, a decision being made, a requirement to respond. Verse 25, he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people. Who would that be? The Gentiles were not his people. You look in the Old Testament, the Gentiles were not his people. I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. So we're talking about that tribe and this tribe and that tribe that used to be crushed, that used to have no hope and no covenant and no God. We're talking about this nation and this country and this group who had nothing to do with God. Now God's going to say, you are my people. What shall we say then? Ah, thank you, Paul. Thank you for this because I was on the fence. I mean, you know, I wasn't so sure. But here's your conclusion, your finale, the pinnacle of all you want to say. What shall we say then that Gentiles who weren't on the treadmill, who weren't exerting willpower, who weren't running after God, who didn't know Him, they attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But... Israel, right there in red, Israel pursuing and running and chasing and working, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that righteousness. All right, part 2C then, we see as Romans continues, we're journeying through these chapters to sort of get a bird's eye view. And here we are in Romans 10. But the righteousness, the one that I've been talking about, this other righteousness that's not self-righteousness, that's not law-based righteousness, this other righteousness that's for whosoever wills, here it is. The righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? Don't be running around saying, well, you're saved, but you're not saved, and you're saved, but you're not saved. And especially, don't be running around saying, well, God's interested in the Jews, but not you Gentiles. Don't be saying that. Don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. 
Don't say in your heart, who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Don't try to make these judgment calls when God has opened the floodgates to whomever will call upon his name. But what does it say? What is this new way of faith? What does it say? It says the word is right there. It's in your ear. It's near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you, any one of you, you Romans, you Jews, you Gentiles, you humans, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, a beautiful passage, but some people say, well, you can't believe. There's no way you can believe. If you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you can't believe. That sounds really cool in philosophy class, but it's just not here in the scriptures. What it says here in the scriptures is that these people can believe in their heart and then something happens and they will be saved as a result of their choice. They are empty and all they have to do is say, fill me. They are dead and all they have to do is say, give me life. And so we can play philosophy games where nobody can choose anything because they're dead. Look, they're dead to God, but they are still alive to spirituality. They are in Adam, alive. Some of them have chosen the occult. Some of them have chosen self-improvement. Some of them have chosen philosophy. Some of them have chosen morality and ethics. But they are seeking. There is something within them that calls out there is this God-shaped vacuum within all of us at birth, and we crave to be filled with the life of God. And what we will see from this passage is not a bunch of philosophy, but human beings, holistic look at a human being who can apparently call upon the name of the Lord. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to analyze it to death. But these are humans that can respond to the gospel, and they will be saved. Romans 10, here it is. I didn't say it. Paul wrote it. It's not my idea. For with the heart, a person believes. What? I'll say it again. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. Was their heart righteous first? Did God make them believe? No. With the heart, a person believes, and the result is righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, and the result is salvation. When a person becomes convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord, crucified, buried, and raised, and they call upon the name of the Lord, there is a heart surgery that happens within them. There is a transformation that occurs. And we can say all day long, they can't believe, they can't choose, they can't blah, 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 blah. The Bible says the opposite. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Isn't that beautiful? Are you disappointed? Well, if some of you are somewhat disappointed, then I would just say we need to revisit the truth. Because the truth will always set us free. And in Jesus, there is no disappointment. He is so good, and He is so good to you, that if you have imagined some other God, no wonder you're disappointed. If you have imagined a God that is frustrated and angry and ticked off at you, no wonder you're disappointed. But you, in Jesus Christ, through what He did, you are at 100% peace with Him, and He is crazy about you. He loves you. He likes you. He doesn't want you to be disappointed. Come unto him and it's supposed to be what? Easy and light. And we find rest. Not anxiety, not stress with him, not trying to stay right with him, not walking in on eggshells. We have something that is easy and light so that we can enjoy rest in him. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Ah, that's your point. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for how many? All who call on Him. What do we have to do? Call on Him. For whoever, Jew or Gentile, makes no difference, Jew or Greek, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
How then will they call on him? I put this in yellow because, you know, it's the Gentiles that needed Paul to go out. It could be true of the Jew as well. They need preachers. They need the message. But Paul is defending his job. That's what he's doing. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Does it sound like it's all just rigged and nothing matters? No, it's not rigged and things do matter. How will they call on him if there's nobody sharing the word? So we are saved by hearing with faith. Galatians 3 tells us this. We receive the Spirit by hearing with faith. So people need to hear. And people need to respond. And that's how we're saved. And they also, skipping forward to verse 23, speaking of the Jews, you know what? They didn't believe. They're rejecting Jesus. They're cut off as branches. They're cut off. But hang on. The Jews also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, if they don't continue in their rejection of Jesus, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. In other words, God is open to the Jews. If they will call upon his name, they too can be grafted back in. They were the tree of God. They were the chosen people of God. They had the market cornered on all things Yahweh. But there's a new name in town, the name of Jesus. And there is one name under heaven by which we are saved. And, and Mr. Jew, if you will call upon the name of Jesus, then you too can be grafted back into that tree and belong to the people of God. This is side note, but it's not about Christians losing their salvation. How many times have we seen this passage about branches being broken off, uh, about supposedly Christians losing their salvation? No, this is about the tree of God, the people of God, which was historically Israelites. And then here comes the gospel and they say, no, thank you. So they're broken off for their unbelief in Messiah. Those who were living in that day who rejected Jesus, broken off. But wait a minute. If they believe, God will pick up that branch and put it right back in. And they can belong. Romans 10, 32. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to how many? All. You ever wondered what Romans 1, 2, and 3 are about? Everybody's condemned. If you've got the law, you're condemned under it. If you don't have the law, you're still condemned because of conscience. Law and conscience, we're all dead. We all need life. God has shut up all in disobedience, Jews and Gentiles, so that he can show mercy to all. Not just some, not a pre-selected group, but all. All right, well, we're going to finish today's message with a, a side note, something that will just take a couple of minutes. But here's a phrase often quoted in Acts 13. Acts 13, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Many who, uh, by the idea of individual selection, will go to this passage and they'll quote this phrase to you and say, wait a minute, Acts 13 says, as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. So there, God is picking individuals, and some people have no chance, they would say. Now, wait a minute, though. Let's see what context reveals here. Is this coincidence? Is this coincidence that in Acts 13, there is a context of Gentiles? Let me just read it. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to where? Not just Israel, but to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. What does that mean? That means the Gentiles were appointed to life. That means that the Gentiles were unexpectedly called to this. And so this miracle is now on display right here in Acts chapter 13. The Gentiles heard this. Is it a coincidence? I don't think so. Conclusion, predestination is God's big fat Greek wedding. We said it last week. It deserves repetition today. God's big fat Greek wedding in calling not just Jews, but Gentiles to the wedding table to become the bride of Jesus Christ. Wow. Let's thank 
our God. Father, we thank you that it's not so clear and that we have to trust your heart. We read an unclear passage and we must go to a clear one. We read that you say you want to have mercy on all. We read that whosoever calls upon your name will be saved. We read that it's not just for Jews but Gentiles. We read that your will is that none perish but all believe. We read these things, even John 3.16. We read that you so loved the world. And then we get to difficult passages and we doubt your love. We doubt your plan. We doubt your purpose. Father, we thank you that your heart is so big that you want to save anyone and everyone who will call upon your name. Father, we thank you that that means we get the privilege of being involved. We get to be in it. We get to not only hear and believe ourselves, but we get to share and celebrate this hope that is within us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel invitation. We thank you that it is not hard. It is not about willpower and trying. We thank you that it is all about your mercy and grace that you have extended to anyone and everyone. Wow. We thank you. As Gentiles, we thank you. As Jews, some of us, we thank you. No matter our background or lineage, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.